Welcome. 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 Could everyone please stand for the presentation of the colors? Everyone can be seated. Before we begin today's celebration, I'd like to have a round of applause for the Vermont Symphonic Winds. Good afternoon and welcome. I want to remind everybody to please turn your cell phones off. Thank you. So welcome to this spirit and joyful occasion for the 150th birthday of Burlington. I'm Doreen Kraft. I'm the executive director of Burlington City Arts, and I am proud to serve as your MC for today. Today, we have the opportunity to reflect upon the past to place ourselves, our history, our traditions, and to reflect about the here and now, and then begin to imagine our future. Our esteemed speakers today will lead you through this journey and help paint a picture of then and now and provide keen insights for your reflection and action. What incredible good fortune we have we all are blessed with the love of a place that we call Burlington, a community that embodies our values, our common struggles, and our desire to be good, actually to be great. Without delay, let the festivities begin. Our first speaker today is Ame Lambert. She is the Chief Diversity Officer for Champlain College, her passion is empowerment and capacity building, and she is the proud mother of Me Day, the most precious and perfect 14-month-old ever. <laughs> Good afternoon and happy birthday, Bolington and the Bolingtonians. As has been said, an event like this gives us the opportunity to reflect on how far we've come and dream of how far we want to go. In that spirit, I celebrate Burlington's reality of being a more diverse community than anyone could have imagined 150 years ago or even 150 months ago. And I celebrate all of the many leaders, elders, and ordinary folks who have worked hard and are working hard to make this a sustainable reality. I also celebrate our dream of equity and inclusion. We dream of a Burlington with full access to opportunity. We dream of a Burlington where both new arrivals and folks generations deep find a path to economic independence. 
We dream of a Burlington where the people here are represented throughout and up the city's critical structures and education, fairness, and justice feel within the reach of all of us. We dream of a Burlington where our vitality is driven by the best of all of us. Making our dream a reality requires action. So let me talk a little bit about that. I'm here today because BCA's and Doreen Kraft and Mayor Weinberger heard me speak over a year ago at a Team Wise event. There are many lessons to be learned from this that can be applied to making our dream a reality. First, we need partners. Champlain College was only able to hold the event because the city and the Partnership for Change collaborated with us. Thank you, folks. Second, comfort zones exist for a reason. We need them, but we need to step out of our comfort zones periodically. Champlain College had to step up and out to make the event happen, and community members had to step out to come to Champlain for the event. As a strong introvert who is usually home doing homework and now childcare, I even had to step out to be at the event. Third, we need to use our voices. I used my voice that evening and people heard me. But more importantly, when folks were putting this event together, they made sure that there was representation of all of Burlington. Connected to that, my final recommendation is that we ask for what we need because it is often within reach. Doreen didn't remember my name, but she shared that she was looking for me. What do you know? She worked with my colleague, Rebecca, who connected us. Making our dream a reality also requires encouragement and inspiration. So I want to focus on what my presence here today means. I'm a woman of color and I am an immigrant. A 1.5-er, as I like to describe those of us who were not born in the US, but have now lived here longer than anywhere else. My bicultural identity always draws me to the space in between and always draws me to those who don't quite fit in. I recognize that I am a foreigner, but one who is not foreign enough to be fully shut out. I also recognize that I am the privileged product of educated parents and I am educated myself. So that gives me some access. Access I feel a responsibility to use to create access for others. I was recently privileged to have a conversation about the future of the American dream initiated by Chief Futurist, Intel's Chief Futurist, Brian David Johnson and hosted by Champlain College. Brian, AALV's Yakuba Bogre, Champlain's Alec Oliver and I spoke about the American dream from the perspective of those on the margins, those for whom the dream seems unattainable for a variety of reasons. We explored the potential not being realized in many communities, including our own, especially with young people. We talked about the systemic impediments that prevent the transfer of skills from athletic fields and courts to the classroom and from overseas colleges and workplaces here. We talked about the need for equity of access to head-raising confidence-building experiences and access to robust, multi-stakeholder narratives about history and culture that inspire the sense that we too do this. Basically, we talked about hope. And hope is what this day is about. It is about a hope for a Burlington that is good for more of us, where we have access to what we need to become who we are supposed to so that we can also be givers where the belief that we can achieve keeps us working and reaching and prevents us from slipping into despair or delinquency. Hope is also why I'm here today. I hope my presence communicates to all of my people and all of the communities on the outside that people are thinking about us and making room for us. And I hope it communicates to all those communities with power and access that they should be thinking about us and making room for us. I hope my presence communicates that the story is now incomplete without us. I hope my presence communicates that we have the capacity to sit at the table. We just need folks to make room, to invite us, and like everybody else, we need people to believe in that capacity and to develop it. I hope my presence communicates that competence and excellence show up in different ways, and these multiple ways are valid, so we sometimes need to look a little deeper. I hope my presence communicates that you don't need to be rich on the important people list or have it all together to be a contributor. I hope my presence communicates that we all have value and the city needs us. So to those of you on the margins, 
whether just a little bit or a whole lot, especially the young ones. I say happy birthday to us. There's room for us at this table and we are needed here. You are home. This is your city and your time is now. So rise up and take your place because we can't be the Burlington of our dreams without you. This invested mother of a daughter born in this city really needs us to be that Burlington. So I pledge to also do my part. Let's make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, M.A., so much. Mayor Moreau Weinberger. Moreau was elected to serve the city of Burlington as mayor in March of 2012. His love of history and his love of this community moved him to establish a committee that actually included his dad, Michael Weinberger, to help bring you this celebration today. Without further ado, Mayor Weinberger. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming out and being part of this special day. Um, I would like to start by just uh, thanking a few people. Um, we're going to hear from everyone up here on the stage. So let me, I'd just like to recognize a few other people, not on the stage, but who have served this city very well in a variety of roles. We have, um, we have city councilors Max Tracy and Karen Paul here with us, and we have former city council chair Bill Keogh with us. Um, we uh, are unable to be joined uh, by Senator Leahy and Senator Sanders, um, but they have both uh, sent special messages, and we will be hearing from them um, uh, through, through, the, through those messages later. Um, we uh, owe a special thanks. You know, part of this day is, and we'll hear more detail from this from City Council President Joan Shannon about the investments that have been made in this room um, around today's birthday, including the chairs that you're sitting on down here. And uh, all told, about $90,000 of uh, private funds have been raised to reinvest in this space, this uh, temple of democracy here on Lower Church Street. And um, that has come from many sources, including many individuals who uh, will have a chance and to uh, have their names on, on these chairs. But we also want to recognize a, a few um, major sponsors, uh, including Merchants Banks, Northfield Savings Bank, and SimQuest. And then our lead underwriter, uh, KeyBank, represented by Don Baker here, who uh, is part of a bank that for many years has been part of one of our great community events, the the the, the Vermont City Marathon um, found this as a new way to show their commitment to the city of Burlington. We thank you for that, Don. I also just want to say a personal thanks to uh, my wife, Stacy, who uh, may have escaped into the hallway with uh, our newest addition, Ada, my daughter, Lee Lynn, who's up there in the balcony, and uh, my mom, Ethel, and Father Michael, who, because he was such a great birthday cake maker for me and my sisters, we did put him in charge of this uh, cake effort here today, and it looks like it's come out well, so. One hundred and fifty years ago, soon after the city was incorporated, the first mayor of Burlington, A. L. Catlin, came before the city council to provide the first mayor's annual report. The short speech is in many ways a, a testament to the notion that some things never change. Mayor Catlin made his top focus clear, stating, a subject which demands our special and immediate attention is our financial condition. His next subject was the police department and public safety, and then a discussion of the city's streets in which he promises that the Southern Connector is about to be completed. <laughs> so the, uh, the connection he was focused on at the time was building Maple Street the rest of the way down to what they called Shelburne Street at the time. Um, uh, 
When Catlin discussed the special needs and circumstances of the soldiers returning home from the Civil War, just then, they were still in the final months of that long, terrible war, um, he could just as well have been speaking about the many Vermont veterans returning from World War II or Vietnam or the conflicts around the world today. Catlin was speaking at a unique moment in Burlington's history. Not only had the community just become a city, but the people gathered here in 1865 stood on the verge of a new age for Burlington, one that would revolve around Lake Champlain. In the most moving section of the speech, Mayor Catlin speaks with an optimism about the future that still very much resonates today, saying, these are his words, we represent a young city, which, in time, which may in time be known and distinguished as the Queen City of New England. It has just been launched upon a career that I trust will prove prosperous and happy. Its location for natural beauty is not equaled in any part of our country. And for natural and acquired advantages in a business point of view, for manufacturers, and as a general business character, few places are its equal and none surpass it. Callan also closed with a sentiment that still guides all of us in public office or in positions of community leadership today when he stated, quote, may the records of this year, when complete, exhibit proofs of our good stewardship. And these trusts, when we surrender them to our successors, carry with them the assurances that they have not suffered by our administration. I hope that when all is said and done with our time here, our successors will be able to look back and say that we too kept our commitment to good stewardship of our community. And looking out at the many gathered here today who have given so much to our city already, I'm confident they will. The speech, however, is also a testament to the dramatic change we have experienced as a city over 150 years and the enlarged sense of ambition and stewardship that defines our community today. In his very first words, Catlin addressed only the, quote, gentlemen of the city council. The city of immigrants from around the world that is today striving to embrace diversity and inclusion was still many years away. Women's suffrage was still more than 50 years away, and the female presidents of the city council that include Jane Nodell, Sharon Busher, Joan Shannon, and Joyce Desotels were still more than 100 years away. Much of what we think of as municipal government did not exist yet, and of course does not appear in the mayor's speech or budget. There was no library, Burlington Electric Department, airport, or parks department. Though interestingly, Catlin did speak at some length about the need for new cemeteries, which would soon double as our earliest city parks. While Catlin noted the beauty of the lake, his focus on Lake Champlain was different than our focus today. It was that it offered the cheapest mode of transportation for seven or eight months of the year for moving timber. And in 1865, Burlington was just entering its heyday as a timber capital. Today's focus on environmental stewardship and recreational enjoyment of the lake is not hinted at in the speech. And who would have thought 150 years ago that the Burlington Electric Department would generate or source its, list, its energy entirely from renewable power as we now do? The milestone that we are observing today is on one level the recognition of a bureaucratic change. As Catlin said, by the act of incorporation, the form of government is now changed from the old town organization to that of a city. It enlarges the powers of administration and consequently increases the responsibility. This story of coming together as Burlingtonians and organizing ourselves in new ways to expand our abilities and take on new challenges is one that has been repeated many times since 1865. To cite just a few examples from recent decades, we have re-envisioned and rebuilt the industrial lakefront of Catlin's time as a 21st century waterfront of parks and bike paths. We reimagined and rebuilt Church Street as a pedestrian marketplace, and the industrial areas of Pine Street have been reborn as a vibrant center for the arts and the creative economy. We dreamed up a grocery co-op, a farmer's market, the Intervale Center, and a new way to feed school children and completely transform the quality and focus of our food systems. And we are here today, we are here today to give thanks to the countless civic and community leaders and generations of Burlingtonians from all backgrounds, nationalities, and political parties who through their hard work, creativity, collaboration, and persistence have built the city that we love today. From the start, we've been a people who show up, who work together, who are resolute and see the job through. These qualities have never been truer of Burlingtonians than they are today. So here on February, 25th, February 21st, 2015, 
We are again gathered at a time of great promise and hope. Through our roads, our airport, institutions of learning and medicine, and telecommunications, we are better engaged with the rest of the country and the globe than we have ever been. We still represent a young city and are still set in a place of unequaled beauty. Let us recommit ourselves to the Burlington ethic of continuous collaboration, renewal, and improvement. Let us begin today the ambitious task of ensuring that Burlington's next 150 years are even more prosperous and happy than its first. Thank you. He served in the Vermont Senate from 1981 to 1989, and then again from 2002 to 2006. Currently, he serves as Vermont's congressman since his election in 2007. We are honored that he is able to be with us today for this wonderful gathering. U.S. Congressman Peter Welsh. Thank you. You know, uh, the weather is pretty lousy out there, but I understand uh, uh, from the Robins that Senator Leahy is sending up pictures of his backyard in Virginia where the snow is deeper there than here. So he's got an excuse. But I know he would love to be here. In fact, one of my first experiences in Burlington, uh, I went to college, to Holy Cross College down in Massachusetts, and I wanted to come up to Vermont after. And I was here on a winter day uh, looking for... Uh, internships in offices and I remember standing on a, a day very much like this in a phone booth remember those days <laughs> calling up Patrick Leahy uh, who was then uh, the prosecutor here uh, but I don't think he was there he must have been at a press conference or something uh, <laughs> and uh, here I am and it's great to be here and I know Patrick and Bernie uh, uh, would love to be here you know I listened uh, to Ami and to uh, Moreau in the two words uh, that they used that I thought really summed up the essence of Burlington. Uh, Ami, you talked about inclusion, uh, and Moreau, you talked about stewardship. And what is a city? But one where it can be filled with people who have enough self-confidence that they can be welcoming and inclusive, knowing it's not about building a moat or putting up walls. It's about breaking them down and creating an environment where folks who want to contribute have an opportunity to do it, regardless of race, ethnicity, uh, or personal background. And how do you renew that? You know, we've seen throughout the world that that is not an automatic. When you see the kind of ethnic strife that exists all around the world where people make another choice, it's not an automatic. It takes a kind of character, and it takes a kind of confidence that this city has shown an ability to have over the 150 years plus, to make room for new people, to make room for new ideas, and to have them blend into the tradition that has been established by the work that's been done before. So that commitment and that ability to renew that's embodied, I think, with this wonderful speech that Ami gave about inclusion is so much the essence of Burlington and why it's doing so well now. And then Moreau, you know, you mentioned stewardship. And isn't that our responsibility? You know, we all have different ways we can contribute. We all have different skills. The folks here uh, range everywhere from people who've made enormous contributions in the arts to folks who've been builders uh, in this city. Uh, to some of our financial and business leaders, uh, but everybody has something that they can contribute using the skills they have, but the fundamental core that unites all of us and brings those together is a common commitment to leave behind something that's better than what you found. So for 150 years, this city has managed to make adjustments and just think what had, it has had to go through the Civil War, World War I, the Depression before World War I, the Depression, World War II, all of these things uh, that were challenging 
and create enormous tension, sometimes reflected, Bill, at those uh, city council meetings that you would sit in, where there would be enormous tension about what to do and how to do it and finding a way to come together. But that hurly-burly of politics and that hurly-burly of life ultimately congealed so that it came out with an opportunity for people who wanted to contribute to have a place at the table, and it came out with a sense of common obligation to make this city a better place than you found it. So I congratulate all of you who were here for the role that each and every one of you has played individually, but your ability to find a way to do it together. Because we are in this together. Burlington has understood that for 150 years. May it understand it for 150 more. Thank you. He began his political career as the Attorney General of Vermont and served from 1966 to 1974. He is our senior senator from Vermont who has been with us as senator from 1974 until today. He deeply regrets that he cannot be with us here today. U.S. Senator Patrick Leahy has asked that Mayor Weinberger kindly read his letter. Um, Senator Leahy wrote, congratulations to you and the residents of Burlington as you celebrate the Queen City's 150th anniversary. Like you, Marcel and I love Burlington. The shores of Lake Champlain, the Church Street Marketplace, and the vibrant neighborhoods are among the many reasons Burlington is among America's most livable cities. On this important occasion, please accept from me for use outside City Hall, a flag which has flown over the United States Capitol. We do have that flag here today, and uh, we, we uh, appreciate this gesture from the senator, and, and we'll be using it going forward. So, thank you to Senator Leahy, and uh, I think next we are going to hear um, from uh, Jeff Munger, representing Senator Sanders, former mayor of Burlington, as well as former U.S. congressman, and uh, we appreciate Jeff very much uh, you being here today. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Bernie would really like to be here, but uh, you know he's got some things that he's uh, thinking about, and he's somewhere in the Midwest as uh, I speak. I think it's uh, Iowa somewhere. <laughs> Something happens there. Anyway, so he asked me to read this letter from him. Dear friends, I'm sorry I cannot join you today as Burlington celebrates the 150 the anniversary of its incorporation as a city. Of course, Burlington storied history goes a bit farther back to its organization as a town in 1785. I had the honor of serving as mayor of Burlington at a crossroads in the Queen City's history. It was truly a privilege to serve the people of Burlington in that capacity. And I am enormously proud to have played a role with many of you gathered here today, helping our city become the great place it is today. It's easier to forget that 35 years ago, the waterfront was feel, filled with rail yards and oil tank farms. There was no community boathouse or waterfront bike, bike path. And the idea of a city government that would stand up for ordinary people promote affordable housing through a community land trust, encourage good paying jobs, and work for better, safer, and more engaged neighborhoods had not yet become a reality. As a proud resident of Burlington, I join you in celebrating the rich history of our city, truly one of the best small cities in the world. Sincerely, Bernie Sanders, United States Senate. Next, we have the delight of hearing from Vince Feeney. Many of you know him. He's a local historian. 
and he is currently working on a book about the history of Burlington. Welcome, Vince Feeney. Thank you. Um, as you know, historians spend a lot of time in libraries and archives, and it's not very frequent that we get to speak in uh, such a, a large setting with a balcony. And I, I'm always tremendously impressed to see people who uh, spend a great deal of time speaking to large audiences. Uh, while I am somewhat uh, uh, awkward in front of them, in fact, uh, I get so nervous. I don't think I've been as nervous as this since I went before the parole board. I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I gave a talk earlier today, uh, about an hour talk, and for those people that were at that uh, uh, talk, uh, I have to apologize because I'm going to use some of the same bits of information here in the uh, short period of time that, that I have. Uh, I've been asked, I think, to give this talk because uh, we wanted to know what the setting was. Why did Burlington feel a need to become a city in 1865? Um, and so that's the setting that I want to give you and the problems that Burlington faced at the time. Uh, in, in 1860, okay, the town of Burlington, which of course included South Burlington, was a small place, little over 7,000 people, with a cluster of people in this urban area, which literally was west of the Great Ravine, right? That big gash in the ground that kind of split uh, our city in half at, at one time. Most of it, not all of it, most of it filled in today. Uh, at the same time, in the 60s, we underwent a, an explosion in population, uh, mainly brought about by the Civil War, right? Our textile mills in Winooski were, were booming. Uh, there was a great demand for lumber, and Lawrence Barnes, the man who really kind of uh, exploited that moment in bringing down lumber from Canada and then transshipping it via the railroad out of Berlin to places south, uh, built up a tremendous business in which other lumber people jumped in. So much so, uh, with so much labor coming into the area, it's also the great period of French-Canadian mi migration into the area, that by 1870, in what is now the city of Burlington, okay, the smaller geographic area than what we were talking about in 1860, there were 13,000 people. That's almost 100% increase, right? Tremendous increase. The problem was there are some negatives when you grow that fast, and it was the negatives that prompted the, the town fathers at that time to say, we better become a city because we need to deal with some of these problems. Uh, and when I say we, we're really talking about the people that lived in that urban core because the farmers out in what is today South Burlington, right, they didn't want to pay for these problems. They didn't benefit from the improvements that we made. So what were the two key areas of concern? They, they are what I like to call the wet issues, right? Uh, some issues don't go away, probably. <laughs> um, here's what I mean. The water supply in Burlington for this growing pop population, right? Uh, there were about a thousand people in Burlington, the urban core, that were serviced by a water system. There was a spring uh, with a reservoir about where Pearl Street and Williams meet. I, I wonder sometimes if homeowners up there ever experienced kind of water issues in their basement because there was a spring there, okay? Uh, and so there was piping that serviced about a thousand people in Burlington. There were 650 villagers, okay, people in town, who got their water by going down to the lake, probably with a cart of some, port, uh, some type, and with casks, filling that up with water and bringing it back to their homes or their tenements, whatever. Uh, about 1,200 people got their waters from cisterns, they probably had something like rain barrels, right, that, that have come back at lately, right, in the, the back of their building, collected water, and then it was put into a cistern in the basement. Uh, so either they either had cisterns or they had wells in town, right? A lot of uh, homes still had the, their wells. 57 people got their water from springs and 48 from neighbors. Clearly, when you have a, a, now an urban area of 14,000 people, 
you needed to do something with your uh, water system. And that's why about the time, right, once Burlington becomes a city in 1865, that the reservoir is put in up at the top of the hill by, by the university and a piping system put in. The, now the other issue, the other wet issue was sewage. And this may have been much more problematic even the, than the, the water issue. Uh, there was uh, Dr. Thayer, who became the, the first health officer in the city of Burlington. He issued a report, but you can go back a few years, right? This is, uh, his report is kind of after the fact that is this, Burlington has become a city, but he's describing what was there when it became a city. He found that there were four antiquated sewer lines in Burlington. The main line, there was one big main line, essentially followed the ravine, that great ravine that ran from the northwest corner of town to the, the, the southwest corner uh, of town, and then simply emptied into what they called the cove. There was a small cove south of Maple Street, okay, right into the lake, right? We still need to clean up the lake today, as Senator Leahy uh, would well know and has been working towards. The other three sewer lines, in a way, were more interesting and even more awful, right? Uh, what Dr. Thayer found is that in those sewer lines, the sewage right, was put in one end of the line, you know, brought in from the different homes, and simply dumped out into another neighborhood. Right? <laughs> Talk about kicking the can down the road, right? or kicking something down the road. Right? Uh, there, there were, let's see, no, well, there was that uh, sewage line. The, the last point I, I'm going to make about these problems that the city faced was that Dr. Thayer uh, did a very uh, detailed investigation of, of what was called the, the South Ward. When the city was created, there were three wards, the North Ward, the Central, and the South. And the South, I'm not exactly sure where it began, but I suspect it was either Main Street uh, or Maple Street, uh, but it included a lot of that uh, lakefront area, which was really, the, the lakefront area was the poor area of town, the tenement houses, uh, really some awful dwellings. And what uh, Thayer found there is that about 1,200 people uh, just threw their garbage and what he described as filthy water outside their lodgings. Right? You can imagine what was in filthy water. 60 people had no privies at all. 681 people used poorly constructed privies over vaults or trenches. Uh, needless to say, right, in these kind of conditions, I mean, dirty water and filth and so on, um, a water system that was marginal at best, typhus was a recurring problem. That would every few years, it'd be an outbreak of typhus. Those were the problems that the city fathers, right, said, we've got to deal with that. And the way we've got to do that, we've got to raise taxes, which the farmers out in the, in the countryside, they don't want to pay for. So it was simply agreed they would break uh, off from the town of, uh, uh, of, of Burlington, that is created South Burlington. And Lawrence Barnes, the great lumber baron who was serving in the legislature, he got that change pushed through the state legislature. Uh, I'm going to end that on the facts. I wanted to just. Uh, bring up one point that the mayor uh, has uh, mentioned, and that is uh, Burlington being called the, the Queen City. Uh, it, it's true that, that Mayor Catlin used that phrase. It was fairly common in Burlington in the 1850s, and I, I get asked all the time, well, where did that phrase come from, you know, the Queen City? In the 1830s and 1840s, Cincinnati right, was being called the Queen City of the West. Cincinnati was the first real inland city that is not a, an Atlantic coastal city that became a boom city in America, mainly because of meat packing, right? So people would talk about the Queen City of uh, Cincinnati. And so uh, it becomes a, a fairly common term, right? And if you mention the Queen City, people all, all know that meant Cincinnati. And I think when uh, Mayor Catlin used it, it was in that sense of, you know, if you say it, it will happen. And I'm just going to conclude by saying it certainly did happen. Right? Burlington is a great city. Thank you. Burlington City Councilor Jane Nodell. 
She is currently Ward 2 City Councilor, now in her eighth term. She has served with four mayors from the city's three major political parties. She's seen a lot. <laughs> Burlington City Councilor Jane Nodell. Thank you, Doreen. And Vince, I really want to read that book, and I'm sure there are many others in the room who are anxious to read the entire book. Um, and your remarks certainly put in perspective some of the uh, issues that we deal with today. Um, are, I think it really puts into perspective uh, that we've come a long way in 150 years. And I wanted to just to pick up very briefly on a point that the mayor made, which is that as elected officials and, and people in leadership, that we really are standing on the shoulders of many who have come before us and made great contributions. And if you think back to the 20th century, those, those major contributions came from across the political spectrum. So just to mention a few, uh, Mayor Burns was a Democratic mayor in the 1920s, and he got the Burlington Airport started. And then we had Mayor Cairns, Cairns a Republican mayor in the late 50s and early 60s, who got the Greater Burlington Industrial Corporation started and also was, played a key role in recruiting IBM at a time when we had lost the East Allen Air Force Base and the Winooski woolen mills were closing down. Um, mayor Paquette, Democratic mayor in the 1970s, uh, led an important charge against the Pyramid Mall and really conceived the Church Street Marketplace. Um, and which was a very so critical um, to the future and uh, the economic vitality of Burlington, and also used eminent domain to acquire Letty Park. Um, and we heard, re you know, from from Jeff's comments, a reminder that under under Mayor Sanders, an independent, and Mayor Clavella, progressive, um, we acquired key, a key piece of waterfront land that's now Waterfront Park. We um, created this community economic development office. We invested in the old North End, and so everyone has something to offer. No one has all the answers, and as Congressman Welch said, we do need to continue to work well together in a collaborative spirit, um, and just, let's just keep it going for another 150 years. Thank you. Next we have our wonderful police chief, Mike Sherling. 25 years a police officer, eight years our chief and counting. Mike, please join us. Only seven years, only seven. It's not the years that'll get you, it's the miles. Happy birthday to Burlington. Uh, I was fortunate to be able to grow up here. Uh, went to an elementary school named for Dr. Thayer, S.W. Thayer School in North End. Um, it looked a little different when I was a child. On Main Street where my grandparents lived, we would go there. My grandmother wouldn't come what she called Down Street, all two blocks to Church Street without her hair just right and dressed perfectly. Um, at least in her eyes. And we'd go to the Woolworths lunch counter for a BLT. And th there's some head shaking. You've, you've been there. Uh, Church Street was open to traffic. Uh, it was occupied by a whole bunch of stores that were owned by local folks. There were actually locally owned department stores. Magrams, Abernathy's, Nate's Men's Store, not so much a a department store. Uh, there was a gun shop right there. You could throw a rock and hit it across the street. It looked a little different than it does today. It had its own charm, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the modern Burlington uh, that we enjoy today. Uh, it seemed like everyone who uh, lived here in the city, worked for GE or IBM or Whiting or General Dynamics or T.A. Haig Lumber, locally owned lumber, go figure, Mackenzie Meats, um, or the railroad, which was even bigger than it is today. So a lot of things have changed. Um, 
The police department has stayed fairly consistent. We've evolved quite a bit. Uh, but in 1989, when I was hired, Chief Scully said, you, uh, he said you, you've entered the most noble of professions. And a short time later, he said, S events sometimes overwhelm people. And as I look out across the spectrum of what we do today with about 40,000 calls for service, I'm going to tell you what that call volume was in 1865 in just a second. Uh, those two things ring true uh, pretty much every day. But if you hearken back 150 years, and actually a little bit before that, 1829, Sir Robert Peel invented modern policing in, in downtown London. And just a few years later, uh, as the city was formed, a couple months after the city actually became a city, so June 3rd, uh, Mayor Caitlin appointed the first police chief, Lumen Drew. So it's February 1865, the city gets created, and think about what was happening at that point. The Civil War is coming to a close. It doesn't actually end until April of 1865. President Lincoln is still alive for a few months. And once again, things look quite a bit different uh, 150 years ago than they did today. It wasn't until February 22nd, tomorrow, 150 years ago, that Columbia, South Carolina burned. Uh, it was one of the last major events of the Civil War. So Chief Drew takes over June 3rd. The department starts operations on June 7th, and eight months later, the first city report is published. And there's a paragraph from the mayor and about four paragraphs from the police chief about operations. And here's some of the highlights. The police department today has a, about 100 officers, 137 full-time employees. At that point, they had four, the chief and three officers. And the patrols, which were one for each ward, were from 10 p.m. until daylight. That's it. <laughs> and part of what they did was to, if you look in the report, they were to maintain the lights. So there's a little snippet from there that says, uh, by order of the mayor, thank you very much, city lamps are under the, con under the control of this department are, and are now attended to in a proper manner, just a proper manner. Just cause for complaint is made as to the amount of light, it may be well to take into consideration the use of kerosene instead of gas. So that was one of the concerns of the police chief in the 1866 annual report. So in addition to the four full-time folks, they appointed five uh, what they called contingent officers to be called on. They weren't paid unless they were called on to be paid by the chief. And part of what they did was to patrol the lumber yards and things like that, oftentimes for no pay at all. 248 arrests, that, act, that number actually seemed pretty high to me uh, in 1865. And what was number one? What do you think number one would be today? Alcohol, go figure. 110 of the 248 were for intoxication. Our budget, same numbers are in it, just a different number of zeros. $1,500 was the budget for the department. It's about 15 million today all in. So add a few zeros and we're in business. Uh, the total city budget was $40,644 is what it's listed at. The chief made $544 for eight months at, that ended uh, when they published that report, which would come out to about $816 annually or just about $20,000 in 2015 money. He might have been a little bit underpaid. So what's, what's happened from there? The last 25 years um, have seen dramatic growth. So I think if you were to project the growth line from 1865 through today, it just keeps getting more and more complicated. Uh, when I was hired, we would go into a, literally a closet and there was a box in the middle of that room where you'd get your uniforms, you'd pick a badge and a number that you might like out of a box and maybe it had tin on it, maybe it didn't, and Bill Ward who retired a couple of years ago, was in that closet with now retired Corporal Lynn Evans to get those uniforms. And maybe they fit and maybe they didn't. You bought your own gun if you wanted anything that wasn't an old wheel gun, six shooter. You bought your own bulletproof vest. You bought your own pens and paper. You bought your old Polaroid film if you wanted to take pictures at a crime scene. Today we carry iPads, we issue all of those things. You can have, guys, unlimited paper and pens, <laughs> as much as you want. 
And in 1989, uh, we did our reports with carbon paper and typewriters. That was only 25 years ago. And today it's iPads and I don't know how many computers we have. It's got to be 100. There were two computers in the department at the time, and one of them was a System 36. And if anybody's ever tried to use one of those, they're not easy. So over those 25 years, uh, we've responded to about a million calls, about 40,000 a year, and had about three to four million interactions with people. And the one consistent thing, looking at the reports from 1865 through 1989, and now in 2015, is the dedication, perseverance, and professionalism of the men and women that keep the city safe 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not only in the police department, but in the fire department, and in so many of our other city agencies and, and, uh, and departments. But in the police department in particular, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 150 years. I usually say we haven't closed once, but it turns out we weren't open during the day in 1865. <laughs> The sacrifices that these folks make, the grace under constantly evolving pressure that they exhibit, and the support they receive from their family and friends is what endures after 150 years. Thanks to those who are present from the department today, uh, to their family and friends, to my wife Kathy who puts up with what I do for 25 years now. Uh, and I'll close with a quote from Theodore Roosevelt, who was not only a president and a governor, but he served as a police commissioner for the city of New York. And what he said was, for those striving valiantly each day in the honorable profession that is law enforcement and policing, Roosevelt said, far and away the best prize that life offers is a chance to work hard at work worth doing. And that applies not only to us, but to all of the work that you all do here in the city every day, to all of our city employees, police officers, firefighters, public works employees, the folks from the library, the city attorney's office, code enforcement, and most importantly for everyone in the city that contributes and will contribute to the next 150 years to make Burlington, keep Burlington, one of the most livable and vibrant cities in the nation. Thank you very much. She has been on the city council for 12 years and is currently the City Council President for three. Let's welcome Burlington City Council President Joan Shannon. Oops. I suppose you can hear me. Thank you, Doreen, for throwing a great party. And thank you, Mayor Weinberger, for fully embracing and celebrating the importance, importance of this day. And thanks to all of you for, for coming out to wish Burlington a happy birthday and celebrate all of us. So they've given me seven minutes. And while I know you all appreciate that you are sitting in the lap of luxury, those chairs, I will be brief. They only gave me 30 seconds to talk about the $200 million mall. And as council pre president, they tell me I am to preside, not to speak. So I'm well trained in brevity. First, I'd like, to, I'd like us all to take a moment to appreciate this room itself. Most of the time I spend in this room is highly focused on issues, on people, and on making sure that opposing passions don't result in a fight. But today, we have an opportunity to absorb our surroundings and our history. I have been to a few city halls, and what I usually find is a council chambers. This room is nearly single purpose, with sometimes opulent seating, but very few chairs. Even in much longer, larger cities, there's much less space for the public. Their chairs may be more comfortable, but their space is much less welcoming to the masses. Or perhaps there is no expectation that the masses will actually participate or bear witness to the decision-making process. This is truly the hall of the people. Contoy's auditorium is a gathering space for a variety of purposes. Burlington entertains here. There's stand-up comedy, comedy performances, holiday celebrations, first night, heritage festivals, gaming events. Uh, there's a young traditions showcase. 
There's the Spiel Blast Cabaret, yoga and Zumbathons, and musical performances. Community groups gather here, like the Greater Burlington Women's Forum, Peace and Justice Center, the Pride Center of Vermont, and Youth Speak Out. There are business gatherings and craft fairs, farewell parties for employees, and City Arts sponsored performance events. But most of all, we think of Calm Toys as a place for civic engagement. We have great civic debates in this room. It is not infrequently that we fill this hall and we learn and are informed by the issues, concerns, and viewpoints brought forward by the public. I became council president at the tail end of the Occupy movement. In addition to raising public awareness about the increasing disparity of wealth in this country, I want to give credit to the movement for giving the Burlington City Council a new tool to facilitate civil discourse. Presiding over democracy is a daunting task. I don't think I could have done it without this. <laughs> yes, the silent applause really helped manage the mobs of people that started to flood this room to make their voices heard. The vast majority who come to council meetings come to bear witness for other speakers and council action. Still, lots of people come to share their opinion and participate in the civil debate. debate. During my first year as council president, we had numerous occasions where 25, 30, 50 people came to city council to share their thoughts and opinions with us. And they came with many more supporters of their statements, and they filled this hall from top to bottom. On October 28, 2013, we had almost three hours of public forum on the basing of the F-35. Upstairs and downstairs were filled to capacity, and so were the hallways and conference room where the meeting was live streamed. In Burlington, we give the public time and space for civic and civil debate. This is part of our past, present, and future. It is who we are and what we value. Today, our birthday present to the citizens of Burlington include a number of updates to this great hall of the people. We'll start with the room darkening shades. I think they can go up. Look at that. It's like... And they, insulate, and they can go down. And they insulate. It is cold in here, isn't it, Councillor Nodell? A lot of times, it's really cold in here. We have better insulation now. We have LED lights. We have a new screen that doesn't blow from the breezes that come through the closed windows. We have hearing accessibility devices. We have new audio visual components. And I have to say, I'm really impressed with this microphone. Look how, look how far away I am, and it seems to be picking things up. And of course, the chairs. Many of you have already purchased chairs and will soon have your nameplate attached to the little pieces of history you are now sitting in. People have bought chairs for themselves, in memory of loved ones, in the names of their children, in the hopes that someday they'll come back and gaze at those nameplates, and in the name of nonprofits and human service agencies to remind us to include everyone at the table. For mere $150, you too can buy a little piece of history and a presence in the great hall of the people. City Council presidents, present and past, are standing by to take your orders. Is everyone comfortable? I, I know you could just sit here all day, right? Um, we make these improvements for the benefit of the public and to make this a highly functioning great hall of the people that's welcoming to everybody. Thank you all for your help in updating both, both the aesthetics and functioning of this great room for the benefit of the public. And happy birthday to Burlington. Thank you. Now we're going to move into the second part of our program. Uh, for this occasion of our 150th birthday, we commissioned a song to be written for Burlington. Pete Sutherland is going to 
come forth with all of the singers. Just give us a moment. Okay. Uh, before, before I embark on uh, this songwriter version of the City Marathon here that I'm about to do, uh, and thank all the singers referred to as Burlington Youth in your program. You can see some of them are more youthful than others. <laughs> That's what singing will do for you. Thank you to uh, the city for commissioning this song here, and it's my pleasure to give you kind of a movie, a musical movie. Back when Vermont was a gleam in the pupils Of Governor Wentworth, a man of low scruples A family of Yorkers named Burling, of course The naming rights bought for the price of a horse Though it wasn't quite clear which town it was best for It might have been Williston or even Colchester Communications were not quite up to date as broadband had not reached all parts of the state. Now Ira and Ethan, those movers and shakers, with means to buy hundreds of thousands of acres, these land jobbers met. But the very first inning was no time for business. A war was beginning. So they let fall their ledgers and to their bats, for they'd fight at the drop of their tri-cornered hats. Then the town was abandoned to dream of the days far off in the future when voices they'd raise. To the hewers of timber, the clearers of river-rich land, to the raisers of crops and houses and fences by hand, to the greens and the dacks, those hills of great bay. Word to this jewel of a lake that was here at the Queen City's birth, to this spot that's as fine, as fine as any on earth. Now there are things they sat as a long decade passes, development slow as Jamaican molasses, and after the war. If you think things were humming, no way, though for sure civilization was coming. From the courthouse square outward, new streets were appearing, and church steeples rose to inspire the God-fearing. But to call it a city, that's a stretch, my dear friends. It was no match for Albany or even for Jens. Well, slowly came mills for all kinds of materials, Factories for mattresses, glass, and for cereals. Lumber was king, and the lakeside its throne. Big boats by the dozens called Burlington home. When the railroad hit town that sealed it and sold it, so much dang lumber the wharves couldn't hold it. And then, in the blink of an eye, it was done. For Burlington, time for great changes had come. To the hewers of timber, the clearers of river-rich land. To the raisers of crops, of houses and fences by hand. To the greens and the dacks, those hills of great fame, great worth. To this jewel of a lake that was here at the Queen City's birth. To this spot that's as fine, as fine as any on earth.
With the Civil War waning, the town it was wondering if urban and rural their ties should be sundering. Three times on the ballot, the question was raised, and each time the voters, they whinnied their nays. But the citizen lawmakers down in Montpelier, they supposed they knew better. They couldn't brook failure with a town called South Burlington, part of the squaring. The city was chartered with fanfares of blaring. Then the Queen City's engines turned red hot and steamy, like a kid sugared up on a large maple creamy. Downtown flexed its muscles to reach its potential. North and south ends, they grew quite residential. Now the pavement, it rolls out in every direction With stop signs and stoplights at each intersection New schools, new faces, new ways to be learning But every so often, our thoughts, they're returning To the hewers of timber, the clearers of river-rich land To the hewers of crops, the houses and fences by hand Hills of great weight and great worth To this jewel of a lake That was here at the Queen City's birth To this spot that's as fine, as fine As any on earth And now, before closing, one bubble I'll burst with a word on our families known as the first. For we were no wig-wearing Boston town brats who sat down to tea with aristocrats. Our forebears were woodsmen who hewed trees to splinters, swatted flies through the summers and shivered through winters. We're daughters and sons of shipwrights and tanners, and we'll stand you around if you've reasonable manners to the hewers of timber, the clearers of river rich land, to the raisers of crops, of houses and fences by hand. And the Dax, those hills of great weight and great worth. To this jewel of a lake that was here at the Queen City's birth. To this spot that's as fine, as fine as any on Okay, now the, another moment you've been waiting for. What's a birthday without a cake? In fact, actually 32 cakes. <laughs> These two cakes were made by Michael Weinberger and Linda Ayer. They are pretty special and we're going to just take this moment to have it to be the photo op for the cutting of the cake. Okay, you ready? Yeah, you got to make a wish.
come to the many tables that are throughout the auditorium and get yourself some cake. After you've had a chance to say hello to your friends and neighbors and enjoyed some cake, we're going to have the fire and police color guard lead us out as we join a parade of lanterns that have been created by many, many young people throughout Burlington. And we're gonna go up the street. We'll be joined by Brass Balligan and have a parade that goes to the top of Church Street. So please stay with us, but enjoy some cake first. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 